morning, morning, bro. Uh, good morning, good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Onindu Sham Choudhury of the Department of English. Good morning. Um, one of the coordinators of um, um, of this webinar titled Musings on the Body. The other other coordinator, Dr. Lalpati Mar, is also here with us. Um, uh, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Shibashish Vishwas, uh, a professor of English and um, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor of uh, the Deepu campus of Assam University. Uh, we are expecting Professor uh, Obi Gupto, uh, who is a professor of ecology um, and, and the Pro Vice Chancellor of uh, Assam University Silchar campus. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have our vice chancellor today. Uh, our vice chancellor, Professor Dilip Chandranath, he is busy elsewhere. He is a resource person in another webinar. So he'll be joining us tomorrow um, uh, in the morning. Um, we also have with us Professor Dipendu Das, uh, who is uh, a professor of English in uh, our department, the Department of English, Assam University Silcha and also the Dean of uh, the School of English and Foreign Languages. He is also one of the speakers. Uh, he will be speaking tomorrow. Uh, we also have the head of the Department of English, Assam University, uh, Silcha, the and the chairperson of the organizing committee of this webinar, Professor Baby Pushpa Sinha. Um, and I can see a whole lot of uh, old Kalyani Rajan, uh, who teaches in a Delhi University. Uh, Kolkata, Jasmine Chaudhary, uh, Nizora Hazrawika. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, there are a whole lot there in um, uh, the YouTube um, channel. Uh, we have already gone live on YouTube. Um, so actually, uh, the thing is, um, how and why did we come to, um, um, you know, think about organizing a webinar and a webinar on the body? Uh, well, we have been uh, having a spate of webinars uh, in the last uh, few months. Uh, some people would say that we have been having too many webinars. If you go to Facebook, you are flooded with information uh, regarding webinars. Um, you know, but one good thing, of course, is that uh, we are also getting to listen to a wide variety of speakers um, from across the world. Uh, this is the positive point. So we in the Department of English, uh, we thought that we should also jump on the bandwagon and organize some webinars. Uh, so this is the first series of webinars that we have in mind. Um, now, why this webinar on the body? Uh, well, uh, as Dr. Lathakim Mar, the other coordinator of this um, webinar, would uh, possibly agree with me that we in the Department of English, especially in the course of teaching a very popular course that is gender and literature, have been discussing what could be regarded as a kind of an obsession in contemporary culture with regard to our bodies. Uh, we, we seem to be obsessed with our bodies, especially um, how our bodies look or should look um, and act or should act, uh, what um, weight, ideal weight our body should have, um, how our bodies should age and so on and so forth. We seem to be obsessed with our attempts to discipline our bodies into appropriate performances. Now, if you, if you go to um, uh, television, you switch on the television set, uh, apart from, of course, people going after people for a variety of reasons, I mean, uh, something which is um, a prime time obsession nowadays, uh, we, we, uh, we, we also, um, you know, have uh, 
immense uh, popularity of these makeover shows in India and elsewhere. Now, these makeover shows actually uh, point towards the obsession of ours with appropriate bodies. Now, this has also interestingly resulted in a consequent uh, fascination with okay. bodies which do not seem to conform to the norms, uh, bodies which are regarded as freakish bodies. So be it appropriate bodies or freakish bodies, um, one thing which becomes evident here um, is that uh, our bodies are not merely biological. Of course, they are. They are, after all, made of flesh and blood. But they are much more than just um, biological entities. They're also cultural and political, uh, in the sense that we are constantly in the process of manipulating our bodies. Very iconography points towards whether they conform to the norms or resist them uh, in some way or the other. So here, uh, we must remember that it, it is not a female body only uh, which has been disciplined and made to go through a process of constant regulation under the gaze of patriarchy, which uh, uh, Dr. Matangi Krishnamurti would be speaking uh, a little later, would be possibly dealing with. Uh, we also have other kinds of bodies, androgynous bodies and trans bodies, uh, which have been otherwise and ostracized. Is it possible to think that since patriarchy invests so much attention to women, it leads to a kind of uh, an invisibilization of the male body? What about uh, the disabled body? So in this context, uh, we felt that um, a webinar addressing issues and questions pertaining to the body and its cultural representation is pertinent at this point in time. This webinar, as we know, has four speakers. Uh, Dr. Matangi Krishnamurti from IIT Madras. Uh, Dr. Krishnamurti will be speaking on the body in, we already have her here. Um, you know, Dr. Matangi Krishnamurti will be speaking on the body in feminist theory. Uh, and uh, her talk uh, will be followed by uh, a talk by Professor Niladri R. Chatterjee uh, from the University of Kundalini. Uh, Professor Chatterjee will be speaking on uh, the male body and masculinity. And tomorrow we have uh, two uh, talks. Uh, the first one by Professor Dipendu Das um, from Assam University of Tilcha. Here with us is also the Dean of uh, the School of English and Foreign Languages of Assam University, as I've already said. Professor Das will be speaking on androgynous bodies with particular reference to performance. And uh, uh, Professor Bani Brotu Mohanto uh, from Benaros Hindu University. Uh, Professor Mohan, who will be speaking on the disabled body. So uh, I welcome you all to this uh, webinar. Once again, I hope that we will be uh, having four engrossing sessions. Now, one thing which uh, um, um, I must say is that we should be very careful uh, with our microphones and our video cameras. Uh, it, it is very distra distracting for speakers to have someone else's microphone on. I can hear some uh, noises. Uh, so, so if you can, if you can um, kindly, uh, you know, mute yourself. Um, you know, it is imperative that we allow speakers to have a, um, you know, calm atmosphere when presenting. So I would request all of you that unless otherwise asked to, please uh, um, put your um, microphones in a switched off uh, uh, mode and also the video cameras. Okay, so uh, to proceed with uh, uh, the program, the brief uh, introductory program as we have called it, I would now call upon uh, Professor Shibashish Biswas, um, who is a professor of English and the vice chancellor of uh, the Deepu campus of our university to say, say Professor Shivaji Vishwas, please. Thank you, Anindu, at your service. Hello, everyone. Namaskar and good morning. Namaskar, sir. Respected Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Abhik Gupta. Respected Dean, Professor Dipendu Das. 
the chair of the department of english dr baby pushpa sinha most learned speakers dr mathangi krishnamurthy and professor niladri chatterjee the dynamic coordinators dr anindo sham choudhury and dr laltan tv mar faculty members research scholars and students i congratulate the department of english at the silchar headquarters for conceiving this webinar the musings on the body it would be an occasion to celebrate and celebrate as we meet like rajdi's midnight children in a conference of minds in the third space platform of today's meet a bonhomie of the warm pulsating body is missed as also the cup that cheers and aids the mind to news but we are there where we are not if i may draw upon foucault's space behind the mirror my best wishes for the webinar and i am all ears for dr krishnamurthy and professor chatterjee over to anindo over to anindo please দীপেন্দু দাস dean of the school of english and foreign languages the professor in the department of english uh, university center to say a few words please namaskar and uh, good morning to everybody uh, honorable vice chancellor professor dilip chandranath even though he is not here i hope he will be Uh, getting some chance to uh, listen to the recording of the program uh, program sometime uh, after this professor <clears throat> obhi gupta the pro vice chancellor of the university uh, silchar headquarter pro vice chancellor from bifu campus professor shibashish biswas head of the department of english professor baby pushpa sena today national webinar dr anindo sham choudhury and dr laltha ki mar the other colleagues of the university the resource persons the participants and the dear research scholars and students it is so heartening to see that the department of english which has a long history of organizing academic events on regular intervals on very important subjects and issues is back to its track after quite some time with its national webinar i congratulate the department and the core members of the organizing committee on deciding to hold this webinar which is in sync with its rich tradition of the department on a very relevant topic titled musings on the body and in the process creating a platform for the exchange of ideas on a subject that has remained a <clears throat> rich object of biological psychological socio economic cultural and aesthetic enquiries i believe that through the critical investigation of this multi dimensional subject this online platform 
will be able to successfully uh, uh, providing a platform and playing the role of a catalyst in the dissemination of diverse kind of ideas leading to a better understanding of the whole issue. Thank you and wish you all the very best. Over to Anindo Sham uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you for your encouraging words. Um, you have been very inspiring, uh, to say the least. Uh, in fact, you uh, were the person who uh, actually um, was prodding us to um, go for uh, this particular webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Can I now request uh, the head of the department and the chairperson of the organizing committee, uh, Professor D.B. Pushpasina, to say a few words, please? Okay, thank you, Ananda Sham Chaudhary. Yeah. I am having some problems in switching on my video. So, okay. uh, excuse me for that. So, somehow I can switch on my audio. So, that is my problem. Anyway, so a very good morning to all respected invitees, speakers, and my colleagues, dear students, scholars, and others present in this webinar today. I welcome all of you. This webinar is first of its kind to be organized by Department of English, Assam University Silja, on a topic like this. And this would not have been possible without the efforts of the two coordinators, Dr. Anandya Sham Chaudhary and Dr. Laltha Kim Mar, and also our students and my other colleagues. I am also thankful to my respected and dear colleague, Professor Dipendu Das, who readily accepted our request to be one of the speakers in this webinar. I am also thankful to the other three speakers, Professor Niladri R. Chatterjee, Professor Bani Brato Mahanto, and Dr. Mathangi Krishnamurti, who could spare some time from their busy schedule to be a part of our webinar. And during this two days long webinar, our speakers will be throwing adequate light on androgynous, trans body, and disabled bodies. I wish and hope that we will have a very wonderful and enriching experience from this webinar. Thank you, one and all. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Baby Pushpasina. Thank now, you. Uh, yeah, may I request uh, uh, the other coordinator, Dr. Lalta Kitma, to say a few words, please. Hello. Yes. Good morning, everybody. program. I take this opportunity to thank the distinguished academicians who have made their warm presence in this inaugural program of the two-day national webinar organized by the Department of English, Assam University, Silchar. Uh, I would like to give thanks to Honorable Vice Chancellor of Assam University, Dr. Dilip Chandra Nath, though he is not present uh, with us. I also would like to give thanks to uh, Dr. Obi Gupta, Pro Vice Chancellor of Assam University uh, Silcha campus. Also, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and thanks to Professor Sivasius Bishas, uh, Pro VC, Assam University, Dufu campus. And also to the two speakers that we have for today's session, Dr. Mathangi and Professor Niladri R. Chatterjee. I express my sincere gratitude on behalf of the department to all the academicians mentioned. And it is my request and invitation to all the invitees present now here with us to kindly remain present in the session that is to follow. Thank you so much. Welcome you all and thank you so much. Over to uh, ASC, sir. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lal Mar. Uh, so it's time for us to uh, go to the first session, first technical session. Um, the first talk uh, would be given by uh, Dr. Mathangi Krishnamurti, um, 
of IIT Madras. I would request Matangi to switch on her uh, video, please. Yeah, Matangi, if you can switch Hi, on. Hi, Nindyo. Already switched Hi. on. Already switched on, yes. Okay. Hi, Matangi. Good morning. Nice seeing you. Morning. Yeah. Lovely to so, see you too, and welcome to all. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, uh, uh, dear all, uh, Matangi Krishnamurti is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Madras. Her research areas of interest include the anthropology of work, biopolitics, gender and sexuality studies, and urban studies. Her book, One 800 Worlds, The Making of the Indian Call Center Economy, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2018, chronicles the labor practices, life worlds, and media atmospheres of Indian call center workers. Now, Matangi Krishnamurti would be um, speaking on Engendering the Body, a broad review of the body in feminist theory. Over to you, Matangi. Anindya, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me for this wonderful webinar. You're welcome. And I'm delighted to be here. As you, as you had mentioned, webinars have become the order of the day. So many ways we see this becoming our prime mode of exchanging information. So it's doubly interesting to me that today we're speaking about the body while being all disembodied participants in this webinar. I'm very, very happy to be here. So thank you for this kind invitation. Thanks to you and Dr. Lalta Kimar, the organizers of this wonderful webinar. It's a little intimidating to set off the tone because I know I'm being followed by some wonderful speakers. So all I'm going to be able to do today is offer a broad review of the body in feminist theory, as I had mentioned. I also would like to thank Dr. Biswas, Dr. Dash, Dr. Baby Pushpasana for those wonderful words of welcome. And thanks to everybody who's here on this webinar today, listening in. I hope I will have some things to offer that will be of interest. Let me, without further ado, perhaps give you a broad idea of what I'm speaking about. As you know, the body is an intimidating proposition. We are not sure exactly what to make of it, and that might be the response to why is it that we continue to be obsessed with this thing called the body, even though people have written about it incessantly. So very briefly, perhaps for the next 35 to 40 minutes, I will offer my understanding of where I'm plucking out the body from feminist theory. As Onindyo had mentioned, it's not that the body is only about female bodies or female identified bodies. We are talking about ways in which bodies become inculcated into discourse, into power, into material consequences, which is why we are constantly grappling with what is it that is a body. Let me start by saying then that this is a very brief and a very, very selective review. I've taken into account things that have intrigued me that will both reinforce what I understand of the body, but that will also provoke me in ways that make sure that I'm never quite sure what the body is. So for the next 30 minutes or so, what I'm going to do is share some content so you won't have to look at me incessantly speaking. And then I'd love to gather some questions for discussion. All right. Anindyo, can I quickly ask if my slide is visible and if you can still hear me? Yes, uh, Matangi, absolutely visible. Uh, yeah, absolutely fine, absolutely fine. Please carry Wonderful. on. Wonderful. Great. And at some point of time, if I'm going too fast, Anindyo, can I ask for the favor that you interrupt me and ask me to go slow? Yeah, I'm always there. I'm there with you. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Thank so you. Please carry without on. Thanks again. Without further ado, this is a quick review on engendering the body, specifically in feminist theory. So we are looking at 
feminist theories understanding of the body and why theory in particular because i think it would be too much of a challenge to start looking at what all the body means across locales geographies cultural specificities so i'm using very specifically the western canonical understanding of feminist theory and for this you'll have to forgive me but it's only for sparking discussion and we will delve briefly into the sex gender framework and how to understand the body within that for those who are unfamiliar with the sex gender framework i will come to that as well so why body let's answer the question of why this obsessive need to speak about the body and perhaps we can begin like all good academics with descartes and the body mind dichotomy which in my personal opinion has ruined us for the rest of our lives we know that descartes inaugurates this idea of i think therefore i am splitting up our consciousness into body and mind the body becomes an instrument to be directed leading to the question does one have a body or is one a body how is it that one can reconcile living with this kind of split and in this quandary as it were what is the status of a woman's body how do we even locate that within this always already split and feminist theory has been speaking for a long time about how in this kind of binary dualist thinking woman is considered closer to body than to mind more natural more uh, visceral in a particular way so in the dyad of body mind woman equals body male equals mind and as gross said in 94 women are somehow more biological more corporeal more natural than men and i can think of uh, great analogies but think for example about makeup and its status in popular discourse the idea of men preferring women who do not use makeup or the idea of natural makeup makeup that is so not obvious that changes the ways in which the body can be presented but does not appear so in this kind of veneer of duplicity you try and see how is it that one must preserve this idea that women are more natural even in the kind of culture that um, is increasingly prioritizing presentation or control over presentation and therefore in this always already diet corporeality becomes an important set of ideas to confront and engage and in this corporeality my lecture today is only about briefly tracing the body in feminist theory while also admitting that these kinds of traces are fraught and multiple they may not even agree with each other and just for the purpose of a certain kind of chronological flow i do it in tandem with the various waves of feminism so i'm looking primarily at first wave and second wave by the time we come to third and fourth wave you will see during the course of the presentation that the idea of the body itself becomes far more interesting and even more discombobulated and a lot of this also will show up in the lectures that follow so please do stay throughout the webinar and i'm really interested in the kinds of conversations that will emerge between my talk and those of the other speakers after this so we are asking when and where does the body appear and disappear in feminist theory now disappearance i would argue is as important as appearance because where and when does the body become unimportant also tells you about the kinds of constraints or luxuries that society at that particular point of time enjoys think for example about asking the very simple question who is it that can forget about their bodies to whom can the body not matter and following that i'd like you to keep an eye out for what kind of body i'm offering a very modest typology but typologies are useful to me in being able to make connections so across the presentation i will also keep asking what kind of body what happens with first wave feminism first wave is where we all start and we speak about first wave as 
putting forth the idea that women are equally competent political public subjects. And of course, no surprises, the body for first wave feminists is an object of suspicion. You want to move away from the notion that women are natural or women are closer to nature because you're claiming political subjectivity. Notions that the body was a mere enticement for men is what first wave feminists sought to dispel with. Look, for example, at this excerpt from Wollstonecraft, where she says to preserve personal beauty, women's glory, the limbs and faculties are cramped with worse than Chinese pen and the sedentary life which they are condemned to live, whilst boys frolic in the open air, weakens the muscles. Artificial notions of beauty, false descriptions of sensibility have been early entangled with her motives of action. Here, Wollstonecraft is privileging the kind of public life that is necessary for the claiming of political subjectivity. Here you see a dichotomy between the beautiful body versus the thinking mind. And the thinking mind is hierarchically organized in a relationship to the beautiful body that automatically becomes something about equality vis-a-vis -vis men. However, the body does show up in interesting ways in the 19th century in relation to first wave feminism in ways that I would classify as under the sexual reproductive body. Think, for example, about the Contagious Diseases Act in Britain, which permitted women to be forcibly examined for venereal disease. Now, this was, of course, mainly, as you can imagine, about the business of prostitutes, how it could prevent prostitutes from spreading diseases among the Navy and the Army. This period saw a campaign led by Josephine Butler that protested this kind of forcible takeover of women's bodies and argued that they were victims of male and medical appropriation. She termed it medical rape. Of course, the tragic part of this is we still see signs of this in our time and place, we see signs of ways in which the woman's body is something that can be biomedically claimed as suitable for intervention, depending on the circumstance of the day. So I argue that in noticing this point of time, it's also important to see a shift in historical perspectives on how medicalization can justify certain interventions into the female body. The other concerns during this time in continuity were about vulnerability, mortality rates, disease, childbirth, all of these make women's bodies natural receptacles for intervention. Eugenics, of course, where women were considered preservers of racial purity, since they can procreate and raise children, society should have control over these bodies, which are alternatively powerful as much as they are dangerous. And some of this shows up in science fiction dystopian narratives. Think about the writings of Margaret Atwood, for example, or Ursula Le Guin, who are very conscious about the ways in which science fiction narratives can produce things as phantasmic, which otherwise you see existing in everyday life. It's not so far from reality. From here, let's move on to an important text for second wave feminism, namely the second sex, where Simone de Beauvoir speaks about the whole prospect of becoming a woman. And she argues to be present in the world implies strictly that there exists a body which is at once a material thing in the world. It exists, it is real, it is material, but it is also a point of view towards the world. In other words, the body that you occupy and the way that it is seen in society determines how you are able to see the world. And therefore, she is positing this relationship between body and self. I choose this as an important point for locating the body in feminist theory because here you see the beginnings of the sex gender frame. What is this system? And I'm using a text by Nancy Potter called Key Concepts Feminism. 
Gender is an analytical category that refers to the social organization of the relation between the sexes. The term gender designates psychological, social, cultural aspects of maleness and femaleness, although, and this is important as we go forth in this lecture, even biological sex as a natural kind is now questioned by many theorists. At this point, it's only important to remember that second wave inaugurates an important understanding of the term sex and gender, where sex is the body, gender is what culture does with the body. This accomplishes a number of important things. It allows us to see how biological bodies are acculturated or culturally interpreted or constrained in particular ways across different locations. It accounts for difference. At the same time, as is pointed out, even in this definition, biological sex somehow begins to appear as natural, something that is questioned now in ways that I will talk about a little further on. But here the sex gender system merely means this. It talks about the body as the material upon which culture builds meaning. I wanted to bring to your attention something about the meeting point between first wave and second wave in relation to a recent article, 2017, that was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education. And this took into account the intellectual styles of a number of key theorists, second wave and post second wave, including Hannah Arendt, that speaks about heartlessness as an intellectual. This just applies particularly to women in academia or women at the heart of what is considered a mind enterprise and not a bodily one. And yet, all those who identify as female and participate in academia will tell you the body is very much part of these deliberations, except it cannot be spoken about. Let me read you an excerpt. The author says, when I was awaiting my first round of student evaluations, a female colleague warned me, the students, you're either a mother or a bitch. That is, you're either nice, nurturing and helpful or arrogant, dismissive and unavailable. Although I ended up receiving many substantive comments, my personality was often a central matter of discussion. She goes on to say, Decades of research back up my colleagues' warning. A 1999 study of women's emotional labor found that students expect female professors to be nicer than male professors and judge them more harshly when they are not. Male professors are more likely to be called geniuses, while female professors were most often judged on their personality. Many women say that their students frequently treat them like counselors or social workers. Female academics perform the bulk of the emotional labor with both colleagues and students. Here I'd like to add a note that given how female professors or female in academia bear also the additional burden of emotional labor, let's not think for a moment that the body is out of the equation. The body is noticed even more in a profession like academia where you're expected to work harder to make it invisible. Pressures like these might explain why so many academic women I know were intrigued by the premise of Deborah Nelson's new book, Tough Enough, which explores the work of women intellectuals, writers, and artists known for their stoical, even heartless dispositions. Female friends across the academy saw something liberating in the notion of the intentionally called woman intellectual, perhaps it serve as a model for their own escape in the pressures of obligatory emotional labor. Now, emotional labor is not something that I'm discussing today, but it might serve as a natural extension to understanding body and bodily labor in relation to what that body is perceived to be able to deliver. And what kind of body are we talking about? First and foremost, and this cannot escape anybody's attention, the beautiful body. Naomi Wolf says, in our culture, and she's speaking about Western culture writ large, but I think it may apply universally, not one part of a woman's body is left untouched, unaltered. 
from head to toe, every feature of a woman's face, every section of her body is subject to modification. Oninde spoke at the beginning of this webinar about makeover shows and how popular that they are becoming. And in this idea of a makeover, of course, is the idea that we are all dealing with the body very much as part of technologies of self, that the body is a project as much as the self is a project. If you want to get somewhere in life, modify it, alter it, make it flexible. And yet, the materiality of the body and the ways in which it is sharply intervened with in order to produce such endlessly alterable bodies is something that we should all pause on. Let's read a little bit from Naomi Wolf because I find the text, as always, greatly prescient, greatly astute, and greatly fun to read. The beauty myth tells a story. Beauty universally exists. Women must want to embody it. Men must want to possess women who embody it. This embodiment is an imperative for women and not for men which is not quite true. And I'm hoping that other speakers will speak about it a little bit. Uh, there is a new book that's out maybe two days ago called Muscular India, which is about male bodybuilders and the ways that they deal with their body in the profession that is modern urban bodybuilding and encourage people to look at it. But this is not always true. However, it has been true for women for a much longer time. Strong men battle for beautiful women. Beautiful women are more reproductively successful. Women's beauty must correlate to their fertility. And since the system is based on sexual selection, it is inevitable and changeless. Here, again, popular culture is an important litmus to see how society is changing. We know for a while that India has had fair and handsome products as much as fair and lovely. And it says a lot about men's bodies, but it also says a lot about caste bodies in very, very particular ways. So for anybody who's been binge watching a lot more during the pandemic or has been subject to a new film on Netflix called Rat Akeli Hai, an important scene in the film is about the hero applying fair and handsome. None of this is true. Beauty is a currency system, Wolf goes on to say. Like the gold standard, like any economy, it is determined by politics. And these politics keep male dominance intact. The beauty myth, and this is the important part of it, is always actually prescribing behavior and not appearance. Competition between women has been made part of the myth so that women will be divided from one another. And she goes on to speak a little bit about how women's identities are almost always premised upon beauty. That should you not relate to that, you still have to work hard to debate against people who will confine you to that identity in public space. Here's a little project that I would encourage all of you to go look at. It's by a photographer called Rankin, and it's called Selfie Harm. Rankin chronicles how dissatisfied teenagers are with their appearances when they post pictures online. So on your screen, you will see two pictures from the project where this is the amount of alteration that a teenager puts herself through before thinking fit to post the picture. And here are some excerpts from the study. In 2017, Instagram was rated the worst social media platform for mental health by people aged 14 to 24. Both are heavily image focused, both Snapchat and Instagram. Their impact is such that cosmetic surgeons have identified a new trend among would-be patients approaching them for procedures, which will make them resemble their digitally altered Dysmorphia. John Fisher. And the editor has made her consider cosmetic procedures. I use it every time I take a photo. I hate my chin so sometimes, Nick, that smaller smooth out my face and whiten my teeth. She reels off. I want them professionally whitened. Ideally, I'd have my chin, lips, teeth altered, and liposuction. 
But whitening is my main goal. It's least invasive, least costly. I want to look like an edited version of myself, essentially. Here, let me also add an additional factor. This kind of constant self-editing, absorbing all of the unrealistic standard that society imposes upon us also has a much longer intersectional history, of course, of race, class, and gender. Look, for example, at this image on the screen. This is Kim Kardashian with the internet breaking image with the champagne glass, which, however, also evokes a much older image of Saki Bartman, a woman who was paraded across Europe as the Hottentot Venus, as possessing a freakish body that could be fetishized, sexualized, and considered savage and barbaric. Between these two images, you see the kind of mimicry that completely erases this history of racialization, sexualization, and abuse. In many ways, we are looking at image formation in the current era as particularly postmodern, form without content. But dig a little deeper, and you will begin to see how is it that forms of fetishization still persevere in the ways that bodies are produced and consumed. This leads me to my other typological form, which is the medicalized body, which since the second half of the 19th century that saw a focus on demographics and hence reproduction led to a renewed focus on motherhood, contraception, eugenics, and sought to control or medicalize or discipline reproductive processes, sexuality, and the endocrine system. However, this is very, very particular. Well, a lot of medical science still does not for women's pain or the fact of maternal mortality unless it reflects badly on demographics. So here again, you see a simultaneous appearing and disappearing of the female body. <clears throat> Professor Chadi, do you have something to add? I Yeah, Matangi, uh, actually, uh, Professor Chatterjee's question is after yours. Uh, okay. I think he's chatting his system, right? Uh, okay, uh, you may wish to continue. I will ask okay. uh, Professor Niladri Chatterjee to kindly uh, switch off his microphone, mute his microphone. Yeah, Matangi, uh, you, you may wish to continue. All right, thanks, Anandi. And why does it appear and disappear in such an instance? I want to direct you to an article by Sybil Shane Wald, who is a women's health advocate, who says very, very, uh, very cynically, according to the Western medical model, premenstrual syndrome is a disease, menstruation is a disease, pregnancy is a disease, disease, and menopause is a disease. From this model, I've reached the conclusion that being a woman is a disease. This medical body, and I will not go into it in detail for want of time, but speaks about women's bodies or the discourse that is critical of the medicalized body, speaks of women's bodies as manipulated, fragmented, employed, and raided in ways that are altogether different from men's bodies. So here we see there's an argument for difference, not for claiming that only women's bodies are manipulated, but the modality of such manipulation says something about understandings of the female body. And here I give you examples of reproduction, questions of the fetus, medically valued byproducts, and of course, surrogacy, which until recent time had been greatly uh, of great controversial discussion in India until it was recently banned. Here, I also want to briefly direct you to a book by Caroline Criado Perez, 
who speaks about the dangers caused by virtue of thinking of the male body as a universal standard. And from a review of the book, here's a little description. This is a man's world we learn because those who built it didn't take gender differences or bodily differences to account. Most offices we learn are five degrees too cold for women because the formula to determine their temperature was developed in the 1960s based on the metabolic resting rate of a 40 year old 70 kg man. Women's metabolisms are slower. Women in Britain are 50% more likely to be misdiagnosed following a heart attack. Heart failure trials use male participants. Cars are designed around the body of reference man. So although men are more likely to crash, women involved in collisions are 50% more likely to be seriously hurt. I'm sorry, I can hear Namrata Nath's microphone. Would you please switch it off? Namrata, please. Uh, we request the participants to kindly switch off your microphone, please. Yeah, Matangi. I think I apologize for this. Not Please at all. Me. Don't worry about it at all. So in the Please last me. part of this presentation, let me then speak a little bit about the movement from feminist theory to queer theory. And here, I think it would be very useful in all these movements in feminist theory to start talking about both living bodies and legible bodies. So we are talking about two things that are at stake here. What are forms of life? What forms of life are people allowed? And two, how do we decode systems of legibility? Here, I want to move briefly to queer theory. And of course, it's Urtek's Gender Trouble, where Judith Butler says that gender is performative. What we take to be an internal essence of gender is manufactured through a sustained set of acts through the gender stylization of the body. Certain bodily acts we anticipate and produce a hallucin hallucinatory effect of naturalized gestures. Never mind what that means, that will require a separate webinar. But here it's important to understand that Butler is speaking about performative bodies as the very aspect of what we consider to be the relationship between body and gender itself as loose, as flexible, as something that can be played with. So for the last part of my presentation, I want to take you through the experiences of a certain set of people This wonderful photograph that you see is of Castus Semenya, South African middle distance runner, 2016 Olympic gold medalist. Following her victory at the 2000 to sex testing from international competition until 2010, when she was to return to the competition. The photograph that you saw is from Vogue magazine. And here I'm juxtaposing two different photographs now on the track and Semenya in Vogue. So how is it that sex testing or the phenomenon of sex testing exposes to us in many ways? It's mainly women athletes that are subject to it in arbitrary fashion. This here is a photo of Andreha Pejic, formerly known as Andre Pejic, a Bosnian Australian model who underwent sex reassignment surgery in 2013. Before 2013, Pejic was known as the first completely androgynous supermodel. Today, she is one of the most recognizable transgender models in the world. And this here is one of the most interesting icons of the fashion world, Casey Legler writer, restauranteur, model, and former Olympic swimmer, the first woman signed to Ford models to exclusively model men's clothes. And Legler is extremely articulate, so I'm using the interview in which she herself speaks to make apparent the case of living legible bodies. Legler says, I understand signifiers, they're social creatures, but it would be a really beautiful thing if we could all just wear what we wanted without it meaning something. Androgyny has long been self 
replicated in the fashion world. Women have modeled as men, men have modeled as women. Andre Bejic, who she evokes, made a splash in recent years. But it's still rare for a woman to sign a contract to model men's clothing. And Legler claims the contemporary cultural landscape supports a larger interpretation than the one we currently have of female masculinity and masculine femininity. To believe otherwise is to be deceived by a myopic view. While this is, in my understanding, a utopian claim, it is not out of the ordinary. And one of the things we really have to work with then is expanding our repertoire of what are considered to be valid legible bodies. So in summary, the body in feminist theory continues to be an important and difficult provocation. In this lecture, I've gone over the beautiful body, the medicalized body, finally arriving on the living legible body to complicate our myriad understanding. Thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to Thank you, uh, Matangi, for a wonderful presentation. So uh, in this talk, uh, what Matangi has done is she has attempted a broad review of bodies vis-a-vis -vis feminist theory, uh, tracing in turn the appearance and disappearance of embodiment uh, she drew upon a variety of sources across the social sciences and humanities to argue for the body to remain central to our rumination. Also there in the talk were select sources from popular culture meant to serve as open questions for those interested in the location of body in theory at large and feminist theory in particular. Thank you, Mathangi. Um, now, uh, the question answer session will be um, handled by Dr. Lalta Kimar, who I'm sure has a, a lot of questions from the participants. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Lalta Kimar. Thank you, S. C. Sir. Thank you so much, Matangi, ma'am. It was a wonderful presentation, and I believe that uh, presentation many of the participants especially the younger would be scholars will get enough uh, substance for their future research. We have received a good number of questions from the participants. Uh, we will begin with one of the most significant ones. One of the questions is, how does the female body questioned and challenged the patriarchal hierarchy. Madam Matang. Dr. Ma, can you hear me? Can hear you. Yeah, Matangi, you are audible. Okay, so uh, thank you for that question and thanks to all the participants for their very exciting and very complex questions. I must add a caveat that how does the female body challenge the patriarchal hierarchy is uh, the subject of a couple of PhDs. Yeah. Right? But let me start by saying that the female body questions and challenges the hierarchy just by existing. Right? So you start off by saying that this is a very strange body because it's necessary for continuity, yet is always seen as something that needs to be controlled and disciplined and kept in check, that it's dangerous when out of check. And you can see this across discourses across time. So how does it challenge it? Very much by existing. But the form of challenge varies across time. For the purposes of experience, we have organized it as first wave, second wave, third wave, but you see it around you every day. You see it in everyday actions, you see it in institutional change, you see it in structural challenges. So often I think about the idea of the paradox as something that is useful to trying and understanding when and where the female body challenges patriarchal hierarchy. So it's a very short answer, but like I said, I'm not equal to doing more than this. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I believe that Matangi ma'am will be kind enough to provide us her email ID or 
contact number so that the participants, if they like to contact her, they can contact her. And the second question is, how do colored bodies in the context, in Indian context, for instance, the Dalit body and the Muslim body, in their engendered perspective, negotiate the feminist project? I repeat this the question, ma'am. How do the colored bodies in their engendered perspective negotiate the feminist project? This is a greatly important question. And this is something that I would actually encourage you all to look into based on the kind of broad guidelines that I've offered in this review. How do they negotiate it? Through particular cultural mores, through particular experiences, through being politicized in very, very particular ways. And we know that intersectionality works in specific ways in our everyday understanding. So Dalit bodies, Muslim bodies, they are hierarchized also in keeping with the ways in which Muslim or Dalit is. Now you add female onto that, it's not additive. It works in very, very specific ways in relation to public visibility. Now, these kinds of intersections have to be dealt with from within the culture. So I'm not equal to speaking about how is it that these bodies will work, but I will tell you in many ways that our forms of attention have to be tuned into these intersectional understandings to try and decipher these. Dr. Mar, you're mute. I hear you at all. I haven't heard the question. Yeah. Okay, sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah. This is perhaps this is the third. Uh, even though conscious about their body now, is this consciousness still regulatory in nature? Great question. So I also see on the chat window a number of questions about makeup. So let me take both of those in the same response. Yeah, if that's all right, Dr. Mar. Yeah, Matangi, please carry on. Okay, so one of the things to really think about is what discourses should people actually pay attention to? If I'm a feminist, should I not wear makeup? Should I then take into account this understanding that discourse is seeking to discipline me. I'm more conscious about my body. I'm more aware about theory. Which should I listen to? Should I listen to my need for a certain kind of attention within society's structures of regulation? Or should I listen to my feminist consciousness, which is all about denying it? And the answer is always both and. The question, of course, is of how much control does one have? In wearing makeup, am I indulging my own capacity and need for self-expression or am I catering to society's male gaze and regulatory principles which will only view me as desirable or visible or attractive if I wear makeup? And it's always both and. A number of feminists, for example, like Chimamanda Aruji, say that I want to dress up. I want to wear makeup. It's something that I do because I enjoy my body in society. I enjoy performance. It is not to attract someone. The answer is both structural and deeply personal. So I cannot quite adjudicate on both, but I can tell you in many ways that the question of makeup, or there's a question from Namrata about nude makeup, now, what is the kind of artifice that one is indulging in? How is it that one wants to present oneself in society is always both and. It is forms of identity that are available to society that we all selectively participate in. For example, a lot of women will tell you, who do you wear makeup and clothes for? For other women. You don't wear it for the male gaze. You wear it to enjoy each other's appearances as women. Only women notice other women's clothes. Only women will look at women's shoes or makeup and want to share ideas of how to look like that. And this is tremendously enjoyable. So there has to be, excuse me, there has to be a place for joy and excess in the feminist repertoire as much as there is a space for resistance and revolution. Thank you, Matan. 
it was very in response to the question. Uh, I, I believe I should be taking up one of the questions, if not two. One of the questions uh, coming from the participants who are joining us from YouTube. Uh, one of the questions, how do you locate the body with cultural changes? This is Preeta who's asked this, right? So Preeta, thank you for that question. And I'm not quite sure exactly what you're asking. So let me work with what I think you're asking. How does the body feature within culture? The body is the very material of culture. Embodiment is intensely cultural. You don't have one without the other. So many will claim, especially cultural anthropologists, that the body is culture. How do you understand culture? By looking at the body. So the body to me is a series of also symptoms in trying to understand society, in trying to read society. The body is a text as much as it is a material entity. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, AFC, sir? Yeah. Would you like to ask question or add something to the question answer session? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Panna, Paul, um, I had several questions, uh, you know, three or four questions. So, uh, yeah, of course, there have, are so many yeah. questions. Yes. So, so uh, I was trying do... to do my level best to do justice to all the participants okay. yeah. in selecting, you know, uh, one, not yeah. more than two questions from the same participant. I was yeah. trying my level best to do justice to all the other participants. Yes. Yes. So, uh, can we ask? Uh, Panna Pal to unmute himself and to also, um, you know, switch on his video and put these questions think, to Matangi. Yeah. I think, yes, I think he should be allowed to express himself yes. and ask whatever questions that he has in his mind to ask Madam Matangi. Yeah. So, Panna Pal, can you unmute yourself and switch on your video, please? Uh, yeah. I don't know whether I'm audible or not. You are absolutely audible, Panna. Uh, Matangi, uh, Panna uh, has done his MPhil from uh, the Department of English, um, Assam University, Silcha, and is someone who is obsessed with body studies. So, Panna, please, yes, we can see you now as well. Please put Hi, your Panna. questions to uh, Matangi. Hello, madam. Uh, thank you. Uh, for, uh, thank you, sir, for uh, giving me this chance. Uh, Hello, Madam. Uh, it has been a very uh, good talk to listen to, and we have learned a lot from that. So, uh, my uh, one question that I want to ask, and that has been uh, in my mind, is that there is this new movement that has gathered momentum in the recent time that is called Free the Nepal Movement. That is uh, that is getting movement where uh, women are claiming their rights to become topless. So here we can find that there is another sort of uh, like binary sort of thing that is coming in about body is that there is a private body and a public body yeah so how does this whole thing problematizes the whole idea of what you have discussed the beautiful body that okay. is what i want to say uh, like ask so what is your uh, idea on that thank you for the question panna and this is you know a great site to investigate the very questions that you're obsessed with right because it brings in my understanding an intersection between three bodies of theory we're asking about how is the public and private divide organized vis-a-vis -vis society in what kinds of society are body parts discombobulated they're sort of like separated and what is allowed in public what is allowed in private and we know from historical evidence for example that women's chests women's breasts were not uniformly a sexual object cultural anthropology will tell you this that in india for example many have located it within victorian morality or victorian mores in ways in which certain parts of the body were required to be bound and so we've been functioning with this dyad of public private bodies, as you very rightly mentioned, which are not uniform across geographies. Uh, but there's one thing, madam, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. Yes. Yeah, uh, there's one thing because this movement has not been there until as I have gone through this, that uh, 
uh, there has been a movement by the males first in USA because uh, in the 19th century when the males used to go uh, topless on beaches and other things, they were also punished. I mean, they were also put on, uh, in the prison. So after this movement only, women started to talk about that. So is it an innate sort of thing that the women are uh, basically dealing with that they see their body only as, so like, they only talk about certain section of their right only when male has got them because it is only after the male thing that they realize that, okay, I also need to get that right. Ah, uh, so there is one part I agree with and one part I disagree with. One, I think political movements, including feminist movements, gain energy and traction from societies around them. We see it for first wave, we see it for second wave. We know that they're borrowing energy from other intellectual movements. Also, what I like to call cross-fertilization, not they only realize it after men get it that they got it. Right? You're only able to gain structural capacity from what structures offer at various points of time. Two, why is it that they were doing it right after this? Because there is that's how often equality works, right? You're, the first impetus to equality has always been, if they can have it, why can't we have it? Are we not human? Remember Sojourno Truth's pronouncement, ain't I a woman, right? Am I not human? Why am I considered to be less than human? So in a sense, if you think that this followed men's movements, and I'm not sure about that, I think there has been a certain kind of way in which while it may have followed that chronologically, it also focuses on this kind of modern obsession with women's breasts and, and defetishizing that. And there is one another thing uh, inside it that uh, in this movement, there is again uh, two uh, sort of uh, uh, ideas that work. One that is normalizing the, this thing by saying that, okay, it is, uh, okay, till the point that a woman is breastfeeding a child. Okay, you can do that in public. That is why they are actually trying to free the nipple movement through the whole concept of motherhood, which as we know, the Sulamit Firestone and other people have talked about how this actually acts as an operation. Whereas other groups, they are actually saying that, no, it's not only motherhood, it's just a part of my body and Absolutely. I have my right over the body. So in this dichotomy also, we find that the whole movement is getting divided somewhere. So, so yes. let me add to that. I prefer not to talk about division as much as the fact that just because women are getting together doesn't mean we'll agree on everything. I don't know why that burden is placed on women's movements to agree with each other all the time. We're not supernatural entities. In feminism itself, you see a rise in cultural feminism that claims that women deserve equality because we are hierarchically superior, we can be mothers. This is a strain of feminism. There is another strain of feminism that says we just want to be. And between these two, there are different constructions of how the body matters. So the body matching in motherhood is one strain of understanding, which says the body is beautiful because it's feeding a child. It's a source of sustenance. It's beautiful. It's a kind of body that is also specific to the worship of goddesses or the mother figures. There's another strain that says that actually we just want to be normalized, defetishized. Only motherhood should not confer upon me the right to be human. So in these kinds of divisions, you also see the ways in which feminism does not exist or feminist understandings of the body do not exist in a vacuum. They always will be in dialogue and in dialectic with other things in society around them. So to confer on feminist understandings of the body any special knowledge is as problematic as claiming that it doesn't matter. It is social in nature. It is particular to structural power in its in its presence in society. Thank you, ma'am. That okay. was all that I need to ask. Great. Thank you so okay. much for your questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Parna and Matangi, for that uh, engagement. Uh, we can go on and on and on uh, with Matangi, and she has a whole lot of things to say. Um, I have uh, received one message, one question uh, that someone called Agrima Mishra has put. Matangi, if you would like to take that um, question. Uh, she says, um, this is about Hindu philosophy. Uh, she says, Manu goes on and on describing the body of a marriageable woman. So, what is your take on this? 
you would need more than a webinar for my take yeah, on this. Yeah, so, yeah. so let me sort of exempt myself from this to say, read the text on your own. Use your universal principles to try and understanding what is it that the text seeks to do. And what the text seeks to do may be kosher or non-kosher as per your understanding, may affect you in particular ways. But ask the question, in what time is the text written? What is it seeking to do? Thank you, uh, Matangi. Uh, it's 12.16. We are um, uh, now, um, you know, ready for the next session. Uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for this engaging talk and the engaging uh, interactions that we have had after your talk. Thank you, Matangi. Thank you so much. We will um, have more of, we will have more of you uh, in the future. Um, Look forward thank to you it. So much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you thank again. You so thank much. you, everyone, for your time and attention and your wonderful questions. This has been truly, truly enlightening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Madam. Thank, you. thank you so much. Okay, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, Professor Niladvi um, our Chatterjee with us. Niladvida, if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you were audible. Um, Niladvida, so am I visible? Well, yeah, you are visible, perfectly Very good. visible, perfectly Very good. visible, and you are audible too. So, um, yeah. so um, uh, you know, an interesting thing happened. This is for others. An interesting thing happened. You know, I asked uh, uh, Niladvida, as I call him, uh, Niladvida, for his bio note, and then uh, <laughs> he claimed that he's tired of listening. Uh, his bio note <laughs> being read over and over again. He's become a veteran of webinars. You know, he must have spoken in 20 odd webinars. This is the 20th. This, this is, is the 20th. 20th. 20th yes. And he has a great following. I mean, uh, we, we know thousands of people <laughs> to uh, Professor Niladriya Chatterjee. So, um, um, with regard to his introduction, I would just say that I have a long one with me. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's not required um, to be read, I believe, because, uh, uh, you know, the bio notes uh, of Niladriya Chatterjee are there on the internet, all over the internet. So, Professor Niladriya Chatterjee is a professor um, in the University of Kulani, and uh, he would be speaking on um, masculinity and the male body, right? Masculinity and the Male body. So, Niladvida, what I'm doing is, I you don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you, you said that you'll be making some, um, possibly making some powerful points. Right? <laughs> so, uh, you, uh, yeah. So, uh, over to you, Niladvida. Uh, the platform is all yours. Thank you. Um, thank. Uh, this is. I have such a difficulty talking with my earphones on. Um, Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah, Niladri, you're audible. Okay, uh, thank you. I have to begin by uh, uh, thanking, of course, Assam University, the Department of English, uh, for inviting me to, to speak here today. Um, but uh, immediately after doing that, I must say that um, I joined the seminar a little late because um, I took a quick shower and then I joined. And then I had Matangi speaking and I... Uh, I, I uh, was listening to her, I think, when she was uh, halfway through her presentation. Uh, and I have to tell you, Matangi, uh, although we have never met, um, that uh, once I started uh, listening to you, I felt like kicking myself uh, because I then um, started to um, wonder why I didn't join uh, your presentation right from the beginning. Um, uh, Matangi, you and I, uh, we seem to be sort of related in a very strange way because you um, finished your presentation with queer theory, with trans bodies, uh, and I shall actually start my presentation with trans bodies. So um, I, this could not have been better planned. It is to uh, plan this out. Um, it is rather wonderful when this happens. I'm delighted to hear it, Dr. Chenji. 
Uh, so, so this is really astonishing that you you uh, finish with trans bodies, and I actually uh, trans bodies. I use trans bodies to actually uh, use it as my jumping off point. Um, I am actually going to uh, talk about two uh, persons over here. The first um, is obviously going to be Susan. I mean, not obviously, but I think people should know about her work. Uh, not too many people know about her work. So Susan Stryker, S-T-R-Y-K-E-R, -E I think um, her absolutely groundbreaking work um, should uh, be paid attention to because, because of course, Susan Stryker uh, did not start off as um, a woman. Um, she was born what is called biological male, uh, although we know from Judith Butler and, of course, we know um, from uh, the, the vast advances in cultural studies and in medical sciences that, of course, there's no such thing as biological sex. Uh, but Susan Stryker was actually born a boy, um, and then he, uh, she later on transitioned and, and became a woman. Uh, and what sort of complicated her transition even more is that she, she is basically a trans lesbian woman. Which, uh, which sort of adds one greater uh, level of complexity than one that already exists. So what I would really wish to uh, do is just uh, mention one thing that Susan Stryker writes in her essay. And she says that she was um, re misrecognized in several ways. I'm trying to find out um, exactly where she says this. She says that she was misrecognized in several ways uh, because she says that in the body I was born with, I was invisible as the person I wanted to be. That is the first point that she makes. Um, and the second point that she makes, and, and I think um, the much more important point is that the body that she carried before transition um, ended up in her sexuality being misrecognized as heterosexual. That I think is a point that I would want to. Um, sort of uh, dwell upon a little bit. So basically, she believes that because she had um, a body that is gender assigned male at birth, therefore her attraction to women was misrecognized as heterosexual. And I think it is, a, we, we very often talk about misgendering, which of course is, is something that I shall come to very, very soon. Uh, we talk about misgendering um, we also uh, talk about the way in which uh, sometimes sex is, not sometimes, I think all the time, I think when sex is applied to a child, it is uh, applied along patriarchal lines, not along the lines of what the child would ultimately wish to have. But I don't think we talk too much about the misrecognition of sexuality. And I think uh, the fact that uh, Susan Stryker's sexuality was misrecognized as heterosexual is because um, uh, her embodied gender or the gender presentation that patriarchy desired of her was that of, of a cis man. So I think we can, so we can keep 